we probably make that association with infantry, but there's a lot going on. And what are we doing there now particularly? Sort of, you know, training and advising, training and assisting Afghani and Iraqi forces. Um, you know, the infrastructure there is, is mind-boggling. You know, you know we go through billions and billions of dollars. And so it's, again, there's, there's so much just managing that infrastructure, making sure they have parts for equipment. Supply chains. And now probably a lot of what's going on is uh, mostly special operations are going over there now. So kind of going over there, being part of a mission, and coming back. So not as many folks going uh, and staying now. But, you know, when I was there, again, in, in Helmand, I was at a uh, very large base, Camp Leatherneck. I mean, at one time, there was 100,000 people staying at this base. And that's military, it's NATO forces, Contractors, uh, third country nationals, who were folks from India and Ghana and Philippines who were there. They're the cooks, they're the janitors, uh, laundry service. I mean, this is I mean, quite uh, a complex city, really. It was, there's roads, uh, there's a massive airstrip. So, I mean, that just, that blew me away, just the amount of infrastructure uh, that was built up there. All right, so this came out of, uh, I do these, uh, I participate in these uh, returning warrior workshops where we get together, uh, we, we invite folks who have been in the combat zone, veterans, to come uh, maybe months, sometimes maybe even a year or two after their deployment just kind of help them sort of talk through some things. Uh, but one thing yeah, you pick up pretty quick on when you're in there is that uh, there's, there have been folks, particularly, uh, well, I mean, active duty and reserve, who just go and go and go. Uh, one, of, one of the senior enlisted in my Marine unit had done nine deployments. So you've been in Iraq or Afghanistan nine times in like 11 years. Uh, so you wonder why, like, the marriage rate is 75% failure, you know, because these guys are, they're gone all the time, they're in deployment zones. Uh, but reservists too, there's reservists who are just re-upping and re-upping and re-upping. Uh, so we do this workshop with them uh, about, you know, what I, why I hate deployment, why I can't wait to go back. You know, and I remember being in Afghanistan uh, and the days are very long. Sometimes you're like halfway through a day and you're like, is this the same day? Because it feels like it's been three days, you know. You know I want to go home, I want to go home. All the guys, you know, we can't wait, we can't wait, we can't wait to go home. You know. And they get home and they're home like, I want, I want to sign up, I want to go back. You know? And so, you know, what is that? What, what goes into that uh, mentality? Of course, you know, when you're over there, your personal safety, you know, not nearly the casualties that we've had in previous wars, but it's imminent danger is in where you're at. Right? You're out riding on those roads at any moment, something could blow up. And you know, our, our vehicles are armored, They're, they withstand these IEDs a lot more, but just that threat where you rockets blowing up, there's alarms going off all the time. So that's difficult to look with. Uh, for most people, no privacy, right? You're sharing every bit of space, there's no day off, there's no day off in a combat. Right. Every day, you're just, every day is the same thing over and over again. Uh, no free time. Every day is the same. You know, and I'm totally I'm away from all my family and friends. What do I love for, about deployment? Well, again, like that's whether you're active duty reserve. You know, life at Camp Lejeune can be kind of boring because you're just practicing all the time. Or you're reservists, right? You're just kind of we go, we sort of. We train for the time when we deploy. So it's like, oh wow, now I actually get to use this training. Imagine just going to graduate school, going to graduate school, going to graduate school, right? Now I'm gonna get out and do something with it, right? I wanna put this in, in, in the work. And, and certainly adrenaline, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's a real rush being in, sometimes that threat of personal safety is a real adrenaline rush. It just is. Uh, and we like that, right? We like that boost. 
if you're in a combat zone or in a danger zone or a hazardous duty zone, you get extra money. Uh, Afghanistan was a tax-free zone when I was there. I mean, you know, when that end of the month comes, you, you're or the middle of the end of the month, uh, you're like, wow, you know, just leave me here. I'm good. What do I love about the poem? Every day is the same. Now, why do I have that on that side? Well, for a lot of folks, their personal lives, uh, their civilian lives, for reservists or active duty, their home lives are kind of a mess. They've uh, got financial issues. Certainly, they have relationship issues. And, you know, this, there's some predictability. There's some structure. When I'm in the military, I know when everything's going to happen, and, and they like that structure. They, you know, a lot of the folks who join the military maybe not have uh, had the best home life growing up. Or we didn't have all of the support that they needed then. So you do get it there. Again, so I mean, it's like it's wow, it's so good to be away from my family. I mean, I remember talking to reservists. This was uh, you know a female in her forties, and she had done at least two almost back-to-back -back deployments. And she's like, oh, I, I don't really want to go back because you know, marriage is, it's not awful, but it's not good. You know, it's over. And I don't want to go back to it and have to deal with that. I don't want to have to go back and tell him it's over. I don't know if I can. So she's, she's already, she's not even home. She's in Germany. And she's already trying to, like, whip up some other because she does not want to go home and deal with that situation. So it's it's kind of this, you know, it's definitely a, a love-hate relationship. So challenges for veterans. So I'm going to talk a little bit about just challenges coming back from uh, deployment and then challenges uh, just with that transition, either transitioning back to uh, state time for active duty or transitioning out of the military. <coughs> Again, like uh, a huge problem with this, trying to deal with this adrenaline letdown when you come home. You just, you know, your body wants it, you're physically you're like, I need, it. I need some kind of adrenaline rush. Uh, and so you just, you do things to get that rush. So you drive a motorcycle 90 miles an hour. You just get into a fight because that's, that gets you pumped up. So you just pick a fight at the bar. Uh, just go crazy. You have money, and spending money gives some people right that uh, uh, adrenaline rush. Uh, so there was a period of time, I don't have statistics, but that the Army was losing more soldiers after deployment than there were during deployment. Because coming home and just returning to some stresses that they hadn't thought about, and again, like, I missed that, I missed the adrenaline rush, I need it. How do I cope with that? Well, I drink my brains out, uh, I smoke, I do other drugs, some illegal, which are going to get me kicked out of the military, or the military's giving me the drugs. I, you know, there's a lot of ambient going on through, through the military. Uh, and so some of this, you know, we have made deployment so normal, this normalization of the de uh, deployment cycle. So for a lot of the folks we're seeing, for the time of period they were, they were in the military, it was just a normal, that you knew your unit every two years, every two years my unit that I went to Afghanistan with, they went to Afghanistan. Now it wasn't the same people, but you just know, like, I'm going to this unit and I know I'm going to Afghanistan during this time. So it's, again, it does, it's normal for us to go, it's normal for us to come back, it's normal for us to go again. And so there's kind of a, an underappreciation for that transition and what that does to you to kind of go and to come back and, and all those, uh, what that does to your mind. This was a slide that we showed in Germany as part of our 
So again, in Germany, I was doing word transitions. So we tried to kind of educate folks about this is what you've been in, in and this is what it does to you, and then trying to get them ready for when they go home. And these kind of warrior transition uh, programs I found to be highly successful. Uh, the Canadians uh, did one before we did. Uh, the British uh, would do one. Uh, so again, it's one of the, unfortunately not everyone gets to do, uh, but the Navy was, was smart and they got this going. So this is one of the things we're saying, like, look, you know, get ready. When you get home, there's a tendency to engage in these excessive impulsive behaviors to try to get yourself um, that adrenaline rush. Or, again, you're kind of not used to some things. We talk to them a lot about being in traffic and just what that could do to you that it didn't do to you before. One, you probably haven't been driving at all. Or if you have driving, you've been driving an incredibly large vehicle you've been going 20 miles an hour. Uh, so when you get on these multi-lane freeways and there's people coming in and out, that's just a chaos you're not used to. Or if you're in Kabul, uh, one, of the, one of the cities, and you're driving around, you're always wondering, who is this car going to blow me up? Uh, so that kind of hypervigilance, trying to get them ready for, uh, for those kinds of things. And they always laughed at this guy down here. That's not, I didn't put that. That's not even I know. I don't know. Hopefully it was staged. Um, but, uh, but again, kind of that just excessiveness. Just try to say, like, look, they are stressors when you get back. Some of these stressors were already there, and you've just kind of forgotten about them. You probably are running away from them. Like, that's why you want to get on this deployment, which so, because uh, I've got this car payment that's, uh, you know, all the junior enlisted, the Lance Corporal's uh, junior Marines, I mean, they all had like way better cars than I did, you know. Uh, they are driving these new Dodge Challengers that they, you know, they can't afford. So they, you know, they, Financial, legal, relationship stuff is, is almost a norm. So, you know, when I'm on deployment, I don't have to think about those things. And here, we kind of would talk about, uh, again, sort of we were, made them sort of stop and journey. Just to give them a little bit of their mind to kind of catch up with them. Because, you know, we're very efficient now at moving, being able to move people around. So, in the old days, Right, you're coming home from uh, combat and you're going on a ship. And it could take a couple of months. Now, they didn't have kind of programs and they didn't have PowerPoint slides that they showed on the ships, but it just gave time for uh, service men to mind to say, okay, I'm not in this place anymore and I'm getting ready to be in this other place. And they can kind of sit around and talk and joke and be crude. And, uh, so, you know, Vietnam, they kind of probably took a few days to get home because you're flying, but you're going from base to base. It took a little while to come kind of home and get you. you know, we flew on these contracts, uh, airlines, uh, with very bitter flight attendants. Uh, but, I mean, they're. For, we had reservists who Saturday they were in Afghanistan, and the next Saturday they had already gone back to Camp Lejeune, and they had already been sent home to their uh, civilian home. So in seven days, you're, I mean, Afghanistan is, Helmand is like the moon, pretty much. I mean, it's desolate. We call the sand moon dust. It was so fine. You know, it's like there's nothing. And then, and then you're just kind of back. In this place, it's you know, the mind. It's just it's like, is that even? What the hell was that? You know, you're just like spinning. And so, you know, we don't give them any transition time. We just, and then you're not, and you're separated from your unit. You have seven days, uh, they're back. But even active duty, right? I mean, they're one place, and then they're back with their family. And I mean, I got home on Sunday morning at like ten o'clock, and I had to be at work the next day. I've been working for six months. But they, they don't, they just, they're so uh, scared of giving you free time and what you do with it. 
uh, but again, like the brain just does not have time to, to process all of this. This is another thing that maybe medicine had come up with, sort of, to help them see, like, uh, again, sort of what goes on in your brain, this uh, cycles of deployment. So, uh, that all the workup going somewhere and the different things you feel. But again, you sort of think, when I'm getting ready to come home, five, right, that um, everything's going to be great. But there's that sort of, um, you begin to sort of anticipate that, think about that. Uh, and certainly, hopefully, there's somebody waiting for you and is excited to see you. So it's great for a couple of days, but then there's this realization that I haven't been here, um, you move the furniture around. We have a new car. Or, Who are these people? Oh, those are our new neighbors. They're great. You'll love them. You know, uh, all this change. And of course, then what's happened to the service person? You know, that they they change. And maybe you know, the spouse has started doing the checkbook, or the spouse has started mowing the grass, and like so, all these different roles we have to get used to. And that takes some time to kind of figure out who's supposed to be doing what, and where do I sort of fit in here now? Uh, of course, with kids, there's a lot of issues there with little kids running away from you because they don't really, they're scared of you a little bit. Maybe they don't even, right, they don't even know you. They're, they're very little or you know, grade school age, they're kind of, uh, wow, you know. Uh, you know, technology, they've seen you because they've seen you in the little screen. They, they've probably been Skyping with you. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of Wi-Fi over there. But, you know, they're kind of used to seeing you in this little screen, and then now here you are in person, and they're you know, freaking out. Uh, teenagers, of course, are miserable anyway. <laughs> but, you know, you're thinking, oh, my kids are going to be happy to see me, and then, you know, all this stuff. You know, so, we, again, we sort of, like, if you're aware of this, hopefully you can sort of work towards uh, stabilization. And just to say, you know, for folks who are leaving, some of our folks might have separated from active duty, some of the stresses they have, just a lot of freedom, right? I can wear whatever I want, I can go whatever I want, I can report in, no one's checking up on me. Uh, that sounds good, but it can be a stressor. That can be difficult, particularly if they were, you know, they were young and they never really lived on their own and now they're living on their own. Uh, that decision making. And then just sort of learning a whole new bureaucracy. So we, I mean, there's some classes when you leave about here's the resource and here's how to access them, but it's a mess. I mean, I've been to them and I still, I mean, the VA is, it's very, it's huge, it's complicated. Uh, and then you have to come here, this place is huge and it's complicated. And building B and C and E and this person and that person, I mean, I don't know where things are going to. So these people are showing up. More, just more transition stress. So I thought, you know, kind of focusing on that, uh, that stress, and this kind of works towards, uh, for me, what I think we're, we're missing in this whole picture here. Uh, but, you know, Navy Medicine's done a lot of good work on kind of how, how do we, what do we, what have we learned about stress through all these deployments, and how do we sort of communicate that to uh, professionals and to uh, service personnel. So we kind of break it down, we try to talk about there's combat stress and there's operational stress. And we expect you to have it. So trying to kind of, like stress is not unusual, there's nothing wrong with you if you're stressed. We expect you, if you go to a combat zone, or any kind of mobilization, when you're away from your family, even if you're in Germany, you know, there are operational stresses there. That affect your emotional, intellectual, physical, spiritual, behavioral self. Right? And there will be reactions. That stress will manifest itself. So this isn't anything new. We, we've known something happens to uh, military personnel when they go. So even in the Napoleonic Wars, the soldiers had an astonishing. In the Civil War, we called it soldier's heart. World War I, battle um, shell shock. World War II, battle fatigue, combat exhaustion. 
you know. And then here it kind of gets more clinical, which we didn't really call it anything at the time, but eventually we started from Vietnam. There's this stress response syndrome. And then in 1980, came up with PTSD. But you notice now we're not putting it in military terms. You know, so we're saying, well, right, I mean, there are things, anybody who's in trauma, right, you could be in a very difficult, uh, very a bad car accident, and you can have post-traumatic uh, stress. Uh, but I think sort of what we miss is there, there are things that happen uniquely in a combat zone to people. So again, we show them like this really stressed out person. This guy is, is manifesting. The stress is getting to him. He's in this crowd. He doesn't know who's who. He's not, is this going to be chaotic? Are these people my friends? Are they my enemies? And trying to get them like, you've been through something stressful. Like, let's understand it. Let's see if it can, uh, you can use channel that the way to make you stronger. Butterfly, you know, if Butterfly wasn't stressed, he wouldn't fly. And just to say, like, again, these are things we expect to happen to you. We expect, uh, at least for a period of time, right, all these things are going to be sort of difficulty concentrating, irritability, some moodiness, that there's nothing wrong with you at this point, right? We expect you. Why does it affect one person and differently than another, right? These can vary on where you were, what you were doing, what was the command uh, environment like. Uh, do you have any prior trauma? Right, so if you, again, just in your life growing up, uh, all of that, your, your mind. I mean, a lot of the counseling I did was folks, they wasn't, I mean, that's sort of uh, directly related to what they were doing in Afghanistan. It was. You know, one poor kid was, you know, just talking about a, a abuse he was having as, in his early teens. And, like, all of that was kind of flooding him again. He was sort of, you know, all this, all this is kind of unearthed. Uh, that's a buzzword, resiliency. Uh, some people are more resilient than others. What, what is that? So we're trying to get to see, again, there's things we expect you to have, like these stress reactions. Uh, but then there's stress injuries. These are things that when uh, they're a little more serious, or the reactions get serious, they don't go away. They kind of stick around for a while. But even here, so this tree is bending, and it will probably, uh, after the storm, will eventually work itself back upright. This tree has a break, but it's broke. It, it, it has a an injury, but it's, it's not, it's broken, but not destroyed. The tree there, there's mechanisms that will take longer, but even that can sort of heal itself, and that tree can have a happy, fulfilling life. This is, uh, they, these, these guys see this all the time. Just, that's the military, like, just stick in your face, everywhere you go. So they, they see this and they grow up. Not the stress term, please. Right? That, okay, you know, we love you to be in the green, but again, stress happens all the time. You all are stressed right now. Who's in the yellow, right? Some of you are in the yellow. Again, like, so you get to the orange, right? Then this is getting more serious. So you may not be able to kind of deal with this on your own. So now we want you to reach out. Now we want, uh, or as a leader, we want you to sort of see, hey, this person, is having a little more serious stress reaction. Uh, so this, this could be a stress injury, I need to intervene, I need to help this person out. And then we don't want you to get to the red. Hopefully no one's in the red. We don't want you to get down there. That's, that's sort of a medical that diagnosis you have. You know, um, a diagnosis, PTSD. But really, you know, the norm is most of our folks figure this out and they get back to where they need to be, or even here. And it's, it's a pretty small percentage of veterans uh, who get the diagnosis of PTSD. 
what if what things cause stress injury? Again, it, it's it could be you were in a firefight, uh, you were in an explosion, but it could be a lot of other things. So yes, a traumatic event, but just fatigue. You've been in 18 month deployment. Uh, any kind of loss, probably you know certainly a loss. Uh, somebody in your unit is injured or killed in action. Uh, and then I'll talk more about this inner conflict, which I think is pretty pervasive, moral injury. You know, that uh, you can just, uh, your whole kind of world, the inner, uh, inner structure of how you sort of see yourself and see the world has been uh, profoundly disrupted, and you don't know how to put that back together. So we just try to get to like, you know, how do, how do I know where I am? Am I green? Am I yellow? Am I red? Well, just how are you functioning? Check your oils. How is, are you going to work? Are you functioning? If you can go to work, that's good. You can go and do your job and come home, and you're not getting fights with people. You can get out of bed in the morning. How's your interpersonal, your, you know, your family, your intimacy, your intimate relationships? Pleasure, are you finding joy in the things? So if you used to like to go fishing, do you still like to go? Socially, do you want to be around others? Do other people want to be around you? So any of those are kind of an indicator uh, of where I am. Um, so just want to, again, I, in Germany, we were kind of preparing people for the homecoming. Some of those folks have been before. So we had really a lot of interesting conversations about uh, when I get home, how do I uh, talk about my experience. We tried to sort of think about what your, people are going to ask you what you did. You probably have about 20 seconds before their eyes glaze over thinking, like, what am I going to say? How am I going to sort of uh, phrase this to them? But a lot of talk about, you know, there's just sort of this anxiety about, I know people are going to say things to me and it's, it's really going to trigger me and I'm going to get upset. And they're not going to understand why, but I'm really going to get kind of worked up. So there's this little video here is um, a little humorous, but really, I mean, these are all things that I've heard said. I hope you can, sometimes the, uh, they, they're kind of speaking fast, but it's about a two minutes little, it's just actors. Uh, so the actors are pretending to be civilian, one's pretending to be military, and you just hear like, what is the civilian saying to the military? Person. There is some colorful language, so uh, I apologize if the chaplain is offending you. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple of F-bombs, so. Which is how you say good morning in the morning. Platoon? Same run. Mission Impossible? This is, this is my gun, this is fine, and this is for fun. I love that movie. <laughs> I can never join the military. I can't stand when people try to tell me what to do. What does Navy stand for, anyway? I support what you do. What are you guys doing? Again? How are you better? You're not even old. You're way too pretty to be in the military. So you're like a real life jet gene. I bet you look hot with a shaved head. <laughs> Watch out for this guy. Probably got that PTSD. So, um, I have to ask you something. Have you ever killed anybody? Have you ever killed anybody? How's it feel to kill somebody? Yeah, but you couldn't kill me, right? I bet you couldn't kill me. I bet you could kill me right now. So you know you're like brainwashed, right? Like, you are not the same person. Fucking liberals. <laughs> Call of Duty, this shit is crazy. I want to join, but I just don't like getting yelled at. I love me way too much. I'm afraid of guns. I would have joined, but you know, I got into college. Yeah, so I was never in the military, but I mean, like, I went camping once, so I imagine it's basically like that. I support the troops. I got a sticker on my car. <laughs> Fucking liberals. So you're a Republican, right? Did your convoy get blown up by one of those IUDs? <laughs> so, you're a lesbian? The International Guard. So did you learn any Arabic? I love the truth. Totally respect what you guys do. Oh yeah, I'm totally against what we're doing over there. So is it like hot over there? 
But it was so hot out there. Something about one of these gulfs. Mayor, um, fuck yeah. What? We're still over there? Before we go any further, can I catch the PTSD? <laughs> <laughs> Did you kill anybody? That's I mean, people. They're gonna ask me that. They they wanna they wanna know all these details about uh, what I did, which is uh, an issue. One, if, if you did, probably don't want to talk about it. Uh, but if you didn't, then it's kind of undervaluing what then you really didn't deploy. Like if you if you're not out there on patrols with a gun, you didn't really go. We can talk a little bit about why that's out. But the video game thing, you know, I would have done this. I would have, I would have blown them all up. The PTSD, you know, kind of again, like uh, the assumption that you have it, the assumption that you're you're messed up. Uh, if you are, right, you don't like that character, but again, sort of assuming you know, that you're. Screwed up. Uh, assuming that you really uh, bought into why we're over there. That's not really right in the middle of you. I'm going to get to choose. I'm going to go because I believe in it. No, you're going to go because you're told to. Uh, you don't. You just don't really think of it. You just it's what I'm doing day after day. So making an assumption that you are or you aren't. Uh, and then this. Thank you. Right, this uh, people get really agitated. Saying people are going to say thank you for your service. And at first, I was like, it seems pretty innocent, and you know, it's benign at the worst. Right, and what's wrong with that? Uh, and certainly, as as a society, right, we don't we don't want to do what we did in Vietnam, where we uh, blame the troops and ostracize them. Uh, so. But what we we sort of uh, get sort of this thin veneer of appreciation that comes across and thank you. And the problems with that is like in the video, sort of people don't even know where Afghanistan is. No idea geographically. Are we still over there? And I heard that a lot. What? That's a thing? I thought that was over. So you're saying thank you, but you really don't even know. You don't know what it is. You don't know what's going on. Uh, and then kind of moving into that moral injury piece, it's like, you don't know what's going on. And you're thanking me. You don't even know what you're thanking me for. And if you knew, if you knew what I was doing, would you still be saying thank you? And it just, it's kind of that, I don't know that, you know, in, in a sense, like this, nothing inappropriate about saying thank you. I think what it reveals is this 15 year kind of constant deployment is a problem. You know? So it just kind of, I think, exposes that, that wound, that deficiency, that, that problem. Because you know, now somewhere like, what, what do I do? Do I just stare at them? You know, it's like, if you can't say thank you, what do you do? But just kind of know, I mean, I heard of uh, an army guy, Jason Moon. He just sort of, that was one of his, this program, Seven Things Never to Say to Veterans. You know, part of it was like, you know, you know, understand, like, even thank you just really burns some people. So again, it's some of what uh, we try to do is to say everybody sacrifices. Again, because there's so many roles in deployment, and it's, and it's so normative, like you're over there, you're running a supply chain. You know, well, that's, wow, that's similar to what you might do here, right, in a civilian job. Um, it's so normative. It's just to see, like, everybody does sound like sacrifice is a part of going. And just to say, look, you were away from your family, you were away from your significant other, your dog, you know, so reservist, right? You missed your uh, civilian job. And some of them go back to no job. 
It's not supposed to happen, but it does. Because, you know, if I'm Joe Blank's corporal and I get fired, I'm, I'm going to get a lawyer and go after my company, right? Because I can afford that. And Tom Warner can just sort of drag it out for years. And I'm supposed to keep a lawyer on retainer while I'm arguing for my job. You know, so, uh, so, I mean, you, you sort of miss all these things, right? So there's. You know, and if people don't recognize that sacrifice, I think that's part of the problem for them later on. But everybody sacrifices. And so that's why there's uh, this, this piece, moral injury. And this is a term that uh, even the military has kind of come around to uh, accepting. For a while, they, they didn't want to um, acknowledge like, that there is this uh, thing that happens to people in war that we're going to call moral injury. But to me, like this is, of course, you expect this to happen. When you go to combat, you will have moral injury. Again, this is expected. This is, this is what should happen, really. Because, and this is taken from a book called Soul Survivor. Uh, there's several books, good books out there now on moral injury. But basically, we're talking about moral injury, we're talking about a violation of your core belief. Or moral belief, so kind of inner judgment against yourself. Um, so again, it's combat, but it's it's more than that. It's just sort of ways that you know that uh, your basic sense of uh, of self is uh, it's been uh, violated, and you kind of how do I sort of go back to living in that world? How do I find meaning in the world again? My whole sense of meaning has been sort of disrupted. How do I sort of go back to that? can no longer be regarded as decent human beings. So I think that's sort of the problem, again, with the thank you thing, or just coming back is, uh, I don't feel human anymore. I don't, I don't know that I feel like, there were, you know, my, my sense of humanity is disrupted by what I saw other people do, and, and what I did, and what I participated in. Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, we were winning hearts and minds, sort of like Vietnam. So you're going in there and you're doing humanitarian projects or you're, you're making friends, right? And uh, you get to know people. And then all of a sudden, one of them blows you up. So that, what that does to your mind, right? You don't know the enemy. You don't know what the enemy looks like. But you're supposed to keep putting yourself out there, right? You're supposed to, I mean, the... The rules of engagement is absolutely amazing, kind of the restraint that you're asking, you know, a 19-year-old to have. I, I rode around the convoys around Afghanistan, around Helmand province with uh, my unit, and I'm in it's one of those really big trucks. Um, I'm useless, right? I know I've been just sitting there. Uh, but there's a gunner in the top of the vehicle. He's got this very powerful 50 caliber gun. We're riding around, and there are so many restraints on him, like when he can fire that weapon. So you, know, you have to see the target. You have to know that they want to inflict danger on you. So a car is coming at you, driving erratically. Are they just driving crazy because that's how they drive over there, or do they are they after me? Okay, and all of this right is happening in seconds. And you have, they have to go, kind of go, and if they don't, if they don't follow those rules of engagement, then their butt's on the line. So just what I think that does, you know, I have to sort of constantly be you know, assessing threat levels and then who's dangerous and who's not. Um, that's why, you know, we miss wars like World War II. You know, being sarcastic, but, you know, it's like, well, I know these guys are bad guys because they wear like, the bad uniform. Right, we don't get that anymore. So I think that's, uh, and that's, that's folks who are out and about, or you know, anybody. We're just being part of this effort. Like, what, is, what are we doing? Like, what is this about? And I'm not being political. I mean, you will hear service personnel across the spectrum, you know, voice these same things like, how do, you, how do you win a war on terror? Well, how do we know this is over? And it feels like, you know, the folks who have kind of been and go back, you know, they're like, I feel like every time I go, it's the same thing. Like we have to learn the same lessons all over again. We're fighting the same war one year at a time. 
it's, it's a one-year war we've been fighting for 15 years. Uh, some of that I would say too is, uh, again, Afghanistan is, is, at least how my province, is a miserable place uh, to, to exist. It's not meant for life. But these bases, again, like there's all kinds of creature comforts at the bases. Uh, and so you almost feel, like I felt really guilty in a sense. Um, yeah, I had Wi-Fi, people did my laundry for me, the food was amazing. It's really, it was really good food. You know, you think, oh, you're, you're eating MREs. No, no, I mean, some, some folks are eating MREs still, but most people are not eating MREs. They're eating pretty, pretty decent food. Uh, and so just that guilt there, like, am I enjoying this? That's messed up. What's wrong with me? You know, that's kind of sick, isn't it? Again, I think this lack of transition time is part of it too. Like, I just don't have time to process it. Or when I get back, um, I'm removed from my unit so quickly that I mean, they they try to make an effort to keep you in your unit for at least 90 days after deployment. But deployment, like your unit, kind of works up into a deployment. And then when you get back, that's usually when people will switch units. The military is always moving people around, so they do try to keep you together for 90 days, but. So these people who you experience with are, are gone. And that's that support structure, particularly for the poor reservists who in seven days, there's that support structure, that's gone. And we just, we don't have any, we normalize it so much we don't have the rituals. You know, Jim talked about, you talked about some of the, the Greeks, right? Um, the early Christians, indigenous tribes. And if you really read, like, a lot of us recognize, okay, yeah, we, we want to fight this war, we need you to fight this war, but something happened to you, right? You, you did things which were not right. And we know you did. And we're not blaming you or mad at you, but you need some time to get yourself together. So you need a few months to sort of come to terms with yourself and to work that out with the folks you went with. See, we don't, we just, again, like, oh, that was so good, you went, thank you, it's great, let's get you back, let's, it's, nothing's wrong, we're all good. All these websites you can go to, just um, that's that's not a ritual, right? That's not sort of again. Like I am glad there is some recognition now of war injury to sort of say something happens to you when you go and do these things. This is you know so yeah, it's the folks who are in like firefights. But uh, I remember I talked to this in Germany. A lot of folks who I saw coming back there uh, were in support capacities. So they, they operated the drone somewhere. So they're sitting, they're in Afghanistan, but they're sitting there, you know, and they're, uh, some of the drones, they're just doing intelligence. So they're, uh, there's like, used to probably like a special operations patrol. These guys are watching for them. And they're radioing and telling them, hey, watch out for this or that. So they're never out there, but they're totally messed up because they see their special operations guys get attacked. They see what the special ops guys do. Or the folks who are operating the weapons, right? And they're eliminating targets. And they know either they missed the target, they know they've collateral damage, they've killed civilians, they see them die. Uh, and so they're never out there, but they're, they're a mess. Or there was this admin clerk who I talked when I was... Uh, in Afghanistan, who wanted army, but she wanted to talk to a chaplain. I didn't, I didn't know. And she, she's like, I've been out of one of these smaller bases, and I've been writing up the casualty reports for nine months. So she, she's sitting in a plywood office. Her personal threat level really uh, pretty low. I mean, she, she was pretty safe. But she's constantly having to write up what happens to these folks who are getting blown up or shot at. So that we, they, you, know, you can go then tell the, the cable reports. And she is a mess. So it, it, if anyone who's a part of the effort, or another big part of it was, again, Germany, uh, these are like even high ranking officers, these are uh, majors. And, who are like, 
I was in charge of all this money, and it was like, it's wasted, and it's all bribing, and where the Afghanis are just wasting the money, or we're wasting the money. And my supervisor, the American, like, I tried to sort of point out fraud, and I was told, be quiet, don't say anything. And then, again, that moral, your moral core is just, uh, because we're kind of brought up to uh, fairness, right, and justice. Those are things you're supposed to ascribe to. You're supposed to respect life. You're not supposed to hurt people, right? And then they, this is all things that they endure, on a, you're, expo you're exposed to on, on a regular basis. So that's, you know, that's an actively a passive, uh, passive. So again, what am I participating in? Was, was it good? Do, do I feel good about this? And you know, we tried to sort of say, I mean, you sacrificed and, and uh, sacrificed, like that's a good thing. Like you served your country. That's uh, something to feel good about. But that's a tough sell. That was a really tough sell for some of these folks. Uh, I mean, my Marine unit, the guy next to me, operations officer, his wife gave birth to twins while we were over there. So he, I, so I missed that experience, and then he's not feeling, he's feeling like bad because his poor wife is, you know, just gave birth to twins and has to deal with newborn twins. And he's not there to help her out, to get up in the middle of the night, uh, to deal with if she's feeling down. Now, his family had a good support structure. There was a lot of in-laws there and such. Um, but all these, you know, all these, you know, I miss them, and I hate that, but again, and then it's like, and then why did I miss it to be over here? Because we're doing what? You know, like I said, or, you know, just for that leadership interest. So within, and these are the people who you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to be on my side, and you're doing things that are, um, you know, we're supposed to be the, the moral pillar, right? We're here, hey, this, we can show you guys how to do things, and you see underhanded things going on. And that really gets you. Because even if you're not excited about the war effort, you are, you do, you feel good about your unit, right? My guys, kind of disconnected about what the big picture was, but they're very dedicated to their unit, like my fellow Marines. We're here for each other. That's, I feel good about that service. But then when your fellow Marines, your fellow sailors, your fellow Army are the ones underhanding you, that, that shakes you. So, suicide for active duty uh, is, is actually pretty low. Uh, it, it's it's uh, much lower than the national average. And we do a lot. They're always hearing about suicide awareness, and the chaplain has you to do that. They just, I mean, again, like they just pound it. They take a computer program. I talk about it. So they're always hearing about it. Uh, but the real problem, I mean, the suicide rate, where the problem is, is with veterans. They're out. And nobody's there giving them a suicide awareness brief. And no one's there seeing if they're in the orange or the red. And they don't know the resources, or they don't even have the wherewithal to, to reach out to them. And I think a lot of it is because we, we don't name well what they've been through. And we said, oh, you're supposed to feel so good about all this. No, I mean, maybe I, I should eventually come back to that, but I mean, there's, there's probably not a day that goes by that I don't think about my deployment. There's just things that happen, things I've heard, and uh, that just will always, they're just always there, right? It just never goes away. Uh, and so when we, again, we sort of normalize it, we don't sort of allow people to, to process that. So I know that's kind of small print, but um, you know, veterans account for 20% of all deaths from suicide. And a lot of them older, but I fear as this is this group of veterans age, right? That this problem is not not going away. And ambient is not going to help them. That's, that's not going to take away, that's not going to provide the healing that they need.
So, I mean, resiliency is certainly uh, a buzzword. Uh, I, I imagine most of the people who we see here are fairly resilient, right? If they've made it out and they're they're using their tuition benefits, which you know, on them, you know, of those 21 million veterans, like only 9 million are even using their tuition benefits. So, uh, but you know, if they're using them, that's that's something good that's going on there, right? They are thinking forwardly. They're trying to do something for themselves. So, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to have anyone who's uh, terribly unstable. But it is interesting. Like, why do these? Why does it affect some people more than others? And my thing is, well, we are always asking, like, why do some students perform better than that? It's just hard to, it's hard to really name, right? There's such a complicated uh, pool of variables there that how do you sort of pull out one thing. I think the better thing is just sort of keep an eye to sort of see, is this person improving or is their situation degrading? Are they getting you know, better uh, or are they getting worse? And I think that's obvious. I mean, again, good research, and hopefully we'll kind of continue to pick up on things that, that help people be uh, resilient. And some of the things that do work for veterans are just these really basic things, like sitting around and talking in a group, or working on a farm, or getting a pet. You know, again, not ambient. Um, but the, there are really basic things that do seem to help veterans kind of pull it back together. Uh, but there is kind of no one size uh, that's all there. So that's, that's a little bit about my experience and, and what I've seen other people's experience. Certainly, right, this is a big group of people. There's a lot of different perspectives out there. I'm not sort of trying to speak for everybody or to speak for uh, veterans or to be a subject matter uh, expert on it, but. Um, just some things I've kind of picked up. You have questions or comments, Mr. Harless? Yeah, I knew. Uh, well, you were you were you were poised. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas these folks, this is 
not just their job, it's something, I don't know what it is. And I was wondering, what was your sense of, did they themselves understand what the hell they were doing? Yeah, I, well, I think, uh, unfortunately, you know, it, it is all volunteer, but it's, you know, that's sort of a sad social commentary. But this is how people are rescuing themselves from their lives as they're joining the military, you know. Again, because you, you will have a place to sleep and they will feed you, but you don't know what you're volunteering for, right? It's like, oh my gosh, this will get me out of this disaster of my life right here. Or you're in it and your life falls apart and you, instead of dealing with it, I just sort of stay in it. But I do think that is kind of part of the dilemma is like, I, nobody made me do this. I chose to participate in this. Maybe I didn't have a lot of great options, but I did choose this. And why did yeah? Why did I do that? Yeah, why did I? I, I did. I sort of. I can't complain because I've worked on myself, kind of a thing. Um, I also think you know the the thank you part of that. Sometimes is you sense when people are saying that thank you. It's like I'm going to say thank you because that we're done. Like I don't want to know anything about what you have to say. So I'm just going to instead of thanking you after you talk, I'm just going to thank you before you say anything. And you kind of sense that, like, these, these people don't want to know. They don't, there's not that care. So, I, I guess you can probably say the wrong thing, but if, if, if you sense somebody genuinely cares and appreciates you, right, you're, you're much more willing to kind of work through whatever maybe kind of semantics they've uh, thrown out there. Does that... They were they were like third country nationals. You know, it's this whole hierarchy of like a little caste system, you know. Uh, so a lot of them again, like uh, my laundry guy, who I taught, he was from Ghana, and he he loved to talk to me. He, uh, and he did not want the war to end because he was making good money doing laundry at Camp Leatherneck, and he got to go home like every two years for a few weeks, and that was it. Uh, the contractors definitely didn't want to attend either because they were making like six-figure salaries. And that's the weird, like, so you have a contractor there who's doing, uh, operating a drone, and then you've got uh, a sergeant there operating a drone. The sergeant's making, you know, 40000 a year. The contractor's making 120000 They're doing the exact same thing next to each other. Uh, that's, that gets into sort of this, the contractors fighting the war, not the military. Yeah. No. Yeah, and I think even for even for the folks not in uniform. Yeah, John Pierre. Yes, uh, some of our students are veterans. Sure. Uh, they feel some guilt having used that word thank you for service. So is there any substitute? Or how can we handle Yeah, I don't I don't think there's some kind of formula that um, you know, if you have this kind of angst inside, anything could bring it out, you know. Turn in your textbook to chapter five, you know. Ah! You know. <laughs> who knows, right? There's no kind of... Uh, so I don't, I don't think dancing around it necessarily. I think just to be aware of that, um, what, when you do that, what might be going on. Or like, I don't want to be thanked. Certainly, like recognizing, calling out veterans. You, know, you want to, they want to self display. I mean, some of them are very proud and they want to let you know and they want to talk about it. But, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I don't, I think it's more the sincerity. You know. Yes? I was kind of blown away by those uh, suicide statistics. And um, I just, I guess I wanted to run through this and see if I'm kind of understanding it. 
my understanding, the general population, males are about three times more likely to commit suicide. So a lot of the numbers that we see this increased likelihood has to do with the preponderance of males in the military, except for the females. The, the males are about 18% higher uh, risk for suicide than the general population. But it, if I understood correctly, it's 240% higher for females. Are there programs geared specifically toward females who are struggling with self-harm? It's beginning. Like we're beginning to sort of see, I mean, I think some of that is you're dealing with a small uh, base, so any increase is going to be very dramatic because there's uh, not that many have not been that many women. But I think there was this awareness of we, you know, we need to reach out to our female veterans in, in a different way. Uh, but probably in its infancy, I think that awareness and that effort, uh, that, you know, as women are moving up the ranks and becoming generals and admirals, this is certainly helping. That is happening. It's, uh, it is, there's not so much of a glass ceiling anymore. Yeah. Yes. I have um, practical questions as an instructor. What are things maybe we shouldn't do? Especially now I'm teaching online and I've got three veterans in my online, my one online class who have self disclosed. Mm -hmm. So, what are things, uh, you know, I tend to be pretty detailed in my feedback to them about them. Yeah, all the students. And I don't know, you know, I did say thank you for your service. Right, sure. And now I'm feeling like, did I do that? You know, did I do wrong? Or I just want to know what things should I avoid. And also in the online environment where I don't have body language, you know, to help me make sure students know what this is. I think make them make sure they know what the resources are that the school has. Just to sort of like make sure, like, hey, make sure you know. Do you uh, are you getting what you need from our, our veterans uh, folks here? The green zone, I guess, is open for business. I don't think we've got an email about it. But. So we, you know, we're we are doing more here at Wake Tech. So just say, hey, look, there's this uh, resource center that's uh, for you online or seated, right? That that's there for you. Yeah, I certainly don't think like treating them, talking to them differently, or you know, they don't act like oh, you're. Just, if they want to say they are, then say, hey, make sure you know what, what's out there.